Uh, so our next speakers are um, Annette Czesierska and Herman Dr. Dr. Weger. Um, I'm just going to bring up your presentation. Yes, of course, yes. So let's just get the slides up. Um, Thank you. Wow, it's amazing to see so many of you here, especially after lunch. Welcome. So, um, let's see if I get this right. Is it down? It's the down. down. Yay, the agenda. You don't need to see that, that's fine. Who are we? We're the future fox. We obviously like foxes. Um, we are a transport tech company for good. Um, we specialize on community engagement, cities, and sustainable transport, so you will not see us doing automated vehicles. We are a specialist in using new techniques like human-centered design and rapid prototyping. Um, we're currently developing a civic tech tool, which is called Street Builder. A street Builder will allow people to transform the local street. Um, we intend to disrupt local planning. Um, and that's us. All right, so why, why is this an important topic, um, smart cities versus civic tech? So m the majority of the global population live in cities, and it's projected to rise until 2030, and then it'll still be rising after 2030, maybe at a slower rate. Um, and that just provides an enormous amount of data because there's so many interactions with people and services. Uh, so it's a really ripe place for, for a lot of civic tech focus, which I'm sure you know about. Um, but from as business people in this sector, we have to understand the market. And the smart cities market is just vast. It's where all the talking is happening, but it's also projected to be a trillion dollars uh, quite soon. Um, and then you compare that to the sort of what's available for civic tech, and it's, it's a really kind of different picture. Um, and we face this, you know, when we're, we're trying to develop our tool as well. Um, so smart cities are really exciting because there's loads of things that you can measure and stuff. Um, this is a picture from, um, uh, it's, well, this is a uh, Africa Business Insight uh, website, which is actually DHL. So, okay, fair enough, it's like a bit of a different lens. Um, but the immediate uh, thing for me in this picture is, is just where, where are all the people? There's no people in here. It's all about systems. And ultimately, if you're talking about cities, there's not going to be cities without people in them. Um, so this is kind of the driver for a lot of our work. Um, going back to definitions, and uh, it's great. We're new to civic tech. It's great to hear there's not like a really clear def uh, definition of civic tech. We kind of consider civic tech as a subset of smart cities. Um, in smart cities, you can say the end user or the consumer is the citizen, and civic tech we consider as the crowd, key crowd participants. So there's quite an active involvement. Um, smart cities could be for people, civic tech by people. Um, but if you look at it kind of in a sceptical way, you could say smart cities meet authority outcomes. as set that's supposed to help people, but actually all of that is questionable, like I think we talked about in governance. Um, and civic tech is really for people. Um, so that's kind of what we're working from. And following on that, we were scratching our heads thinking, right, okay, now we know more or less what smart cities are, but what, what are they really? And so we set up in this quest of looking at smart cities measures, specific measures in a number of cities. And we came across with a lot of them, and we so very quickly discovered that we came to this eureka moment, and we thought, oh my god, there's different generations of, of smart cities implementations. This is our paper. And then we Googled it, and this guy had done it before. So that happens all the time. It's a really good definition. We really like it. So uh, first generation is the technology is basically driven by private companies that go to governments and say, buy my fancy thing is going to sort out your life. And there's very little uh, thought about what it's actually going to do. So the efficiency, the outcome is not very well defined. Second generation cities realize that they just bought something really expensive. They don't want to do it again. And so they start leading on what they think is a smart city. They set out the agenda, and then they decide how to use the technology. Third generation, the co-creation, is a big, massive step change. It really jumps. You could almost say that it's fourth generation. And it completely turns around, and the city embraces its citizens. And it's the citizens who decide what a smart city means. And so what we did for our analysis is we started um, mapping these specific measures against two basic uh, uh, two basic outcomes, system efficiency and desirable so social change. So system efficiency being kind of reducing waste, reducing cost, uh, reducing the time things uh, they spent doing things. Desirable social change, well, it is what, is, is what it says. 
Um, and we came up with some interesting outcomes. So uh, a lot of open data, a lot of open data. Um, I mean, it makes things more efficient. But the desirable social change, hmm, with some degrees. New Zealand was interesting because as part of their open data for uh, the city, they started integrating, you see the typical things, transport, air quality, and a few other things. And New Zealand started looking at art, uh, access to sports, access to sport facilities, education. So a little bit moving towards civic tech, but not there yet. So a, a sort of a, a success that London claims to have done um, around smart cities is something called Tech City, which is basically getting lots of startup communities to, uh, together and talking about um, uh, using data around city problems. And fair enough, like this is a great thing to do, but um, it's it's not really producing the social outcomes. It's creating business, fine, but a lot of the business outcomes of that are not really affecting social change. This is a true double act. We're practicing for Eurovision. Um, public Wi-Fi is one that we saw all the time. It's kind of very common. And I think the reason why it's there is not because it's weird based per se, but the decision to put in public Wi-Fi, it changes a lot. Some people do it for, some cities do it for the sake of it, just to have public Wi-Fi. Some cities do it because they really want social change. Um, so, yeah, an interesting one. I wouldn't say weird, but interesting nonetheless. Okay, it's not working. Come on. Oh, wrong button. Oh, there we go. So, uh, a smart city that's often billed as sort of the holy grail of smart city, which is in construction now, Songdo City in, in South Korea. Um, uh, it's a walkable city, uh, it's brand new, um, there's just incredible you know, internet things, everything's connected sort of thing. Um, one of the big features there is uh, this RFID home security system where it involves parking, access to your homes and stuff. The point of the city is to get people out and sort of living in this great city because the services are really close to them. But conversely, what's happened, and fair enough, it's a bit early to judge, but what's happened, people are so comfortable and they've got so much security, they feel very secure at home, so they stay at home and they're not actually interacting. And for us, from sort of an urban planning perspective, that's not really a successful kind of social environment for a city. Oh, um, so you would have heard of Cambridge Analytica. It's not really sort of um, a relevant category here. But similarly, talking about data and security, um, so they set, about, set out to kind of achieve system efficiency in uh, politics and, you know, helping candidates work out who to target. Um, but as we've seen, it's gone pretty weird. Um, Singapore, that's, you'll probably know about that from a civic tech perspective more than us, and I'd love to go there at some point. Um, one of the exciting things that they've implemented is real-time traffic control. Um, they were really advanced in road pricing, but they've put in some, um, some great data and it gives sort of citizens this kind of real understanding of why they can't drive into the city. Um, but what you see, so the, the result of this is that uh, efficiency on the road has gone up. So speeds of, traffic speeds have gone up to about 27 kilometers an hour. But from, a, again, an urban planning perspective and from the way that cities need to become more sociable, that's actually taking us in the reverse direction from sort of social outcomes. You want to reduce, keep traffic speeds kind of low to make it a livable city. Um, city map you will have heard about. Um, again, they set out probably just to, to make transport a bit more user centered, um, but they've actually, they're doing quite a lot around system efficiency, so integrating with public authorities. Uh, Singapore's on-demand bus service is being trialled at the moment. Uh, that's a really interesting one. Uber is sort of the counter-example. You're creating, Uber tends to generate new trips in cities, which takes you away from the desirable social change, but on-demand bus services is actually kind of beneficial for the wider public, um, but also making this this city more efficient. I'm just going to skip ahead because I don't want to run out of time. Fix My Street uh, from My Society, which you love very much. Um, it's kind of somewhere in the middle, so it's efficient because it's working with the local authorities and helping them process data, but it's also giving people, ordinary people, more of a control over their streets to change things. Um, and we, as we understand, they're going more in the system efficiency route by integrating fully with the local authority reporting. Um, Street Bank is something that launched several years ago, actually, probably ahead of its time. It's a peer-to-peer -peer lending site, so if you've got an electric drill, you only use it for one minute uh, every year or something. So there are plenty of neighbours that could just borrow that drill from you. It means you don't have to buy a new drill. Um, and that's kind of you know, making people more get to know their neighbours a bit more. But a corollary to that is maybe eBay, where it's kind of a similar process, but it's actually driving sales and you're getting more consumption. And so... We started spotting a trend, so if you can see 
most of the activities that I mentioned there are first generation, um, so led by private companies. Then you start getting to the second generation ones, and they're still all about efficiency. And when we started looking at third generation, they were all civic tech. And so if you look at Amsterdam, I just pick up one of probably 30 examples they've got. It's really, truly participatory. It's absolutely overwhelming. And one of the things they've got is, uh, which is close to our street builder, is a platform for people to design, for older people to design their street spaces. It's absolutely fascinating. And they've got 30 different versions of this. So, absolutely fantastic. And, sorry, yeah. Yes, yeah, similarly, um, an another quite interesting one, which it seems quite sort of basic, um, but really exciting, is in Nairobi. There were no sort of, there was no information on local services um, in one of the, in one of the um, districts called in Kibera. Uh, citizens produced a map, it was their initiative, uh, they generated the, the right information, so rather than somebody like Google coming and saying this is the information that you need, they identified what services they wanted on this map. And the interesting kind of social change element here is that it's made people feel safer because that's the kind of information that people thought was important, so women travelling alone have highlighted you know, the safe routes, and that's not something like Google would have picked up. And it leaves me with a kind of the jewel in the crown, which is Medellin. Medellin used to be the most dangerous city in the planet, and it's now reduced homicide rate, homicide rate by 80%. And partly, or the vast majority of this, has been reduced through participatory programs. Um, they have an incredible platform, civic tech platform, which is called My Medellin, where you can do participatory budgeting, or you can consult, uh, produce ideas, and you have indirect communication with the mayor. It's won awards. Um, and the key thing for Medellin was the uh, outcome for the smart city was integrating uh, society better. So it wasn't about traffic, it wasn't about smart technology, it was about integrating society, social change. Um, so that was quite, that was fascinating in fact. And so, I mean, there's a lot to say about the research. One of the things we found is there's a lot of data, but not necessarily the right data. So the analysis is a bit qualitative um, because the data that there is there is quite difficult to come up with something that measures efficiency or a proper outcome. But anyway, um, the main insight we have is civic tech almost always produces efficiency naturally. The outcome is social impact, but by doing that from the outset, you become more efficient as a city. Um, Data-led smart city initiatives have indirect social out outcomes, but of course, because it's not the main objective, they're often quite weird um, or flawed, and a lot of cities have spent a lot of money on kind of crazy tech. Um, smart city initi initiatives are driven by efficiencies, but defining the type of efficiency is important and often misused, and this is key, uh, and it's the case of Medellin. It's when the efficiency is highlighted and it's social benefit, then we're talking about completely different solutions and completely different approach. Um, uh, and, and this is maybe a bit obvious, but so it kind of confirms our starting point, but um, civic tech has the ability to and must do more to compete with the efficiency-based smart, smart city initiatives. So Fix My Street definitely doing that, um, but we need to see it more um, happen more because there is this big market but if, if it's not taken opportunity of then you have sort of the very efficiency based smart city stuff with weird social outcomes taking over um, or maybe civic tech could complement um, those smart sort of classic smart city approaches um, with additional social impact outcomes I don't really know how that would work uh, but something for you to think about um, and then finally, uh, smart cities have all of this marketing stuff. To, you know, everyone's talking about it. Loads of money's going into internet things, AI. Um, but all of that is kind of, and even citizen empowerment, actually. Intel were talking about um, citizen empowerment uh, through their smart cities work. But is that really the case? And yeah, we could just let them do it, or civic tech services could sort of try and control that dialogue a bit more. Um, right. So... Uh, we have a bit of a challenge now. I think we've got a few minutes. Yeah, six minutes. Okay, very rapid challenge. Um, so turning our insights into a design challenge, I'm just going to skip down to number three um, because this is kind of applies to all and it's, it's quite easy for a post-lunchtime uh, session. How might we make your civic tech service more smart city friendly? Um, so the challenge is we're going to ask you to spend a minute just brainstorming. They gave you post-it notes in your bag, which is really helpful. Um, spend a minute 
thinking about your smart, your civic tech service and how you could convert it into more smart friendly terms and it could be in a light way or a more fundamental way. Um, and then we're going to come back to you and build on that idea. There's a few rules before we do that. Um, so it's all about quantity over quality. So we want to see like five, ten post-it notes in a minute. Uh, no idea is a bad idea. We actually want those, those crazy ideas. Be concise, so if you can fit it on a post-it note, that's great. And do exaggerate, make it really, really big. Okay, um, is everyone clear? Um, so I'm gonna give you one minute alone to, to think about how you can uh, make your civic tech more smart city friendly. The clock's running. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to go through them very quickly. We cannot spend too much time with your ideas. Just want to say two things. The, um, the outcome of this exercise has got two main important things. One, it's a great tactic for us not to speak so much and prepare less. So we're very clever there. The other one is we really think that civic tech can take over smart cities and that, that we can make a massive difference and overtake this kind of crazy idea of just selling technology for the sake of it and civic tech take over the smart city market. Um, Without further ado, where should we start? Who wants to have a go first? This table here. Give us a couple of ideas. Come on. Okay. We just need a couple of ideas from the, from the crowd. What did you come up with? Come on. Oh, there's one over there. Because you need to know. We need better free Wi-Fi. Uh, there's an example which is not, not a public Wi-Fi from cities, but kind of a mesh uh, router system that is kind of a decentralized Wi-Fi run by citizens so that we can do the Wi-Fi situation. Mike is not working. Mike is not working. Who else wants to give us an idea? A couple of ideas? Who else? Someone's volunteering somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Then find the most effective route to AI, so people can discard their in the most effective way. Cool. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very thank you very much. Thank you very much to Annette and Herman for that. So it was a very interesting presentation.